Hello and welcome to our program, Where God Weeps, a program where we talk about the situation of the suffering church around the world. Today it is my very great privilege to speak with Cardinal Polycarp Pengo, the Archbishop of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania and President of SECAM, the Symposium of Episcopal Conferences for Africa and Madagascar. Your Eminence, thank you for being with us here today in our program. It is a great pleasure for me to participate in the program. Your Eminence, you grew up with four brothers and four sisters. What was it like? Did you grow up in a traditionally Catholic family? That's right. My family was uh, traditionally Catholic in the sense that uh, my father and my mother they were, were both baptized as uh, small children. Or only their uh, parents, they were the ones who were converted to, to Christianity. Catholicism. By missionaries? By missionaries, and the missionaries were particularly those, uh, the White Fathers, or now uh, better known as missionaries of Africa. Yes. And uh, they are the ones who converted them. And how was it for you? When did you have a first sense of your vocation? When I was uh, a, a young uh, child in the family, we, we usually went to Mass uh, at, at least every Sunday, but also during weekdays. And during that time, uh, uh, the priests were always uh, saying, uh, in this week we are going to celebrate a particular sense. And, uh, and when it was the 10, uh, during those days, uh, in, uh, on the 26th of January, in my uh, former days, it was St. Polycarp. And the priests always said, on this particular day, on the 26th of January, we are going to celebrate the feast of Polycarp, Bishop and Martyr. Mm -hmm. And so that, uh, uh, I don't know how it entered into my mind. And I went back home all, all, always and said, uh, uh, Mama, uh, I want to become bishop and martyr. And as, uh, Mama said, uh, how can you become a bishop before you become a, a priest? And you cannot become a priest before you go into the seminary. Mm -hmm. I said, no, Mama, uh, the parish priest doesn't uh, speak about a priest or a, semin uh, a seminarian, but he speaks of polycarp bishop and martyr, and I am polycarp, so I am bound to. So that was uh, the beginning of it all. But uh, uh, as I grew up uh, slowly, I come to realize that uh, what Mama was uh, uh, saying was uh, quite was true. true. Was true. So I went to the seminary, uh, but uh, very soon I realized that uh, uh, asking for uh, being a, a, a bishop, and particularly being a martyr, was something <laughs> too, 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 too heavy. Yes. But I continued in the seminary. In the end, as I said, it will be enough that I become a priest. And I was thinking of nothing else but to go to a very remote parish yes. in, in, in the diocese. In the, in and to diocese. serve. Yeah. And to serve. Yeah. Now you are bishop. How do you understand the other part, the martyrdom? Is that part of being a bishop? It, it, actually, it is by being part of uh, uh, acting as a bishop. Uh, this martyrdom in the sense that uh, wh when you want to be a real bishop, you cannot please everybody. And there are so many people who want uh, to, 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 uh, you to divert to, uh, their atten uh, your attention to them. And uh, you really have to sacrifice. And sometimes it can be uh, very painful uh, even within you. And uh, when people do not, uh, a particular priest, when do not act uh, as they should be, and uh, you really need courage and very special courage to go and say, please, this is not what is expected like you, a as father. a priest. Like yeah. a f and you have to be a father. And you have to be a father mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's it. There, it. Yes. Your Episcopal coat of arms is unique. It has a palm tree and in the background a pyramid and then two stars. Can you tell us briefly what is the symbolism of your Episcopal coat of arms? I must start uh, by saying that uh, this symbolism uh, was suggested to me 
by the then apostolic nuncio in Tanzania, who was uh, Archbishop uh, uh, Gian Vincenzo Moreni, who is by now dead. He died a few years, uh, years back. But uh, he came, uh, because when he came to Tanzania, uh, I was rector of the major seminary there in Dar es Salaam. And uh, he kind of uh, liked me and uh, because I was helping him with the uh, translations in Swahili uh, when he was going around. So uh, uh, then when I became a bishop, he said, come, let us sit down together. And then he suggested this, uh, this idea. But, but uh, the, the, the main thing is that we have the uh, two stars. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I, I was appointed bishop not from uh, my diocese, my, my diocese of birth, but I was made a bishop of a, a very remote, remote area. So I had uh, uh, to keep in mind that the star, the Virgin Mary, who guided me in my home diocese, is the same one who will be guiding me in the new diocese. So it is a picture of uh, uh, the, the Our Lady as the, the guide and this uh, Stella, Stella Maris, Stella Maris, Maris yes. particularly. And, uh, but at the same time, down, we have this uh, palm, yes. palm, palm tree. Uh, I knew that the place where I was going, palms were the main uh, uh, plants or the, the main uh, source of uh, living because it was a bit, on, uh, not exactly on the coast, but very uh, close to the coast. And so as I said that uh, starting from the ground, I must try to make the faith grow. And uh, it goes, uh, if you look at the uh, coat of arm uh, carefully, it points exactly to, to, to that uh, cross yes. on top. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, through the cross, I must bring the people to the uh, glory of resurrection. That, that is the, 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 the head on top of it. Yeah. So uh, that's the concept. Behind. And the pyramid? The pyramid actually it came uh, incidentally uh, simply because it would, I wanted to divide the former uh, diocese and, With the new diocese. and the new diocese. So that was the figure which came out. 30% of Tanzania's population is Catholic and about 35% are Muslim. So it's very even balance, if you will, between the two traditions. How are the relations between the Muslim and the Christian community? Yes. Uh, one thing I should like to point out to you is that uh, the Muslims don't agree with those figures because they always want to be more numerous <laughs> than they actually are. Yes. But th uh, that's the, the, those are the real figures. Okay. Those are the real figures. And uh, they insist that there are more because when we combine uh, the Catholics and the Protestants together, we outnumber them okay. and they don't want to accept that. Ah, okay. But in any way, the relationship between the two religious traditions has always been good, except during the last uh, few years, mm. now, now a few dec dec decades, yes. uh, the, there have been this uh, kind of antagonism. Why? Because of the, the group of fundamentalist Muslims, but uh, I should add also, but also on, on the part of Christians, not Catholics, but on the part of Christians, there is uh, this new fundamentalism uh -huh. where the, of the Pentecostals who, who come in and they are, sometimes you think they are reckless in, in, in what they say. They, they pretend to, to, to preach Christ, but in such a way that uh, they are very offensive to, 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 to other people. So what would have started first? Would it have been as a, this polarization as a consequence of the Protestant churches coming in, or is this uh, polarization coming as a consequence also of, let's say, uh, exterior forces, exterior groups coming and working inside? Because if I understand correctly, the yes. relations between the Tanzanians, yes. Muslims and Christians, Christians have been very good over the decades, yes. but it's new forces coming in. Yes, the, the first force coming in was from Islamic fundamentalism. And this, uh, one could say, that the reaction of uh, these uh, Pentecostals and uh, this group uh, came as a reaction. 
But uh, uh, one I can say that even that reaction, even without fundamentalism, Islamic fundamentalism, because we know in other countries where there are not so many uh, Muslims or there's not so much uh, influence of Islamic fundamentalism, the, the, the Pentecostals, wherever they go, they will fight everybody. A threat even to us, uh, fellow Christians. Even, uh, so uh, it's not, it wouldn't be very correct to say that uh, the, the uh, Pentecostals uh, came as a reaction to Islamic fundamentalism. Yes. It's in their nature, yes. uh, as it were. Yes. Yeah. But it's having this unfortunate effect, if you will, of a polarization in the society. That's right. On the other hand, you mentioned in an interview that the, some of the fundamentalist uh, groups coming in, which are foreign, are also funded by, uh, for example, petroleum money from other countries, for example, Saudi Arabia. That's is, right. Is this, uh, is this the reality? It is the reality, and I, I think it's best to own this uh, fact that uh, it's very difficult to distinguish between polit politics and religion for Muslims. The Muslims said uh, they always uh, expect that uh, a political power is supposed to enhance yes. uh, the religious. religious. Mm. And then, uh, so, there's no wonder that uh, the Muslims, they want everywhere that Islam becomes the dominating, uh, dominating uh, force. Mm. Uh, and so it must have also the religious support mm. everywhere. Mm. And so uh, it's true that uh, there they have been a, a lot of influence, a lot of funding from outside, from Islamic countries. Uh, during these last uh, years, uh, which have been a bit unfortunate for Islamic countries because uh, there, there have been uh, such agitation and uh, uh, problems there, we uh, notice very much also in our country that uh, this Islamic fundamentalism uh, Islamic uh, fundamentalists, they are not as loud as they have been before. It, it has this impact on them that uh, they are not too sure of uh, tomorrow. Oh, I see. Because the source of uh, their uh, funding, which gave them the power uh, to talk every, uh, anything they wanted to, now they, they realize that they cannot rely so much on their, 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 their uh, petrol dollar because uh, there the situation is very shaky. But this allows an opportunity for, for you and for the moderate Muslims to perhaps rebuild these good, uh, good relationships in the, in the society again. Yeah, I think so, it does. It does, except for the fact that among those people in power in government, there are some who have this uh, uh, fundamentalist tendency, the, uh, particularly the Muslims, and uh, while they regret that they, they are not having the uh, petrol dollar which they used to get, but they still have this, uh, this desire, desire to, 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 to continue uh, being in, in power. And this is, uh, we are not yet uh, very comfortable. The situation is not yet very comfortable. Because we, of course, we have a concept of the separation of church and state. That's right. But for the Muslim, it's unthinkable to separate the faith from the political from the action. the political action. Yes. That's yes. right. Addressing and going further in this question, um, perhaps one source of, of reconciliation, if you will, is education. And I want to make reference to a quote by Bishop Zhao of Zanzibar, who stated, um, that the church would like to empower Muslims, especially the women. And he said, education that will help them filter the message given or delivered to them, because women are the root of the family and society. Mm -hmm. We know that if we can educate one woman, you have educated a whole village. That's right. Is education also the key for you? The education is the key for us, and particularly where we stress on the effect uh, of the educating a Muslim woman. We don't, uh, we don't say that the boys uh, shouldn't come to us. We are uh, building schools, establishing schools, Catholic schools. Uh, since the government allowed us again to, to do that, we have established uh, quite a number of schools in Tanzania. And in fact, we came to a point where we said everyone who is worthy of the title of bishop whether Catholic or Protestant, must have at least one set of schools from kindergarten through the upper secondary school. 
And, and then from there we... we so you're making it an obligation an, for an the obligation. diocese yes. to have Catholic schools? Yes. Uh, not, not everyone has succeeded to do that, but I must say that we are trying everybody. And uh, another condition which we put up is that the, those are not seminaries. So you cannot say that only uh, Catholics come to these schools. We, they must be open yes. to the whole pop, uh, population of Tanzania so that uh, in the future uh, through education, people realize that uh, there are not uh, so many differences uh, uh, due to religious uh, differences, but uh, if there is anything, it, it depends on the efforts of particular individual. We insist on women, because in Islam, the woman uh, is not educated. Is not educated and is not supposed to be educated. Uh, the woman is there just to, to be dominated by, by, by men. Of course, we had the same uh, in traditional uh, society in Tanzania, but religion came to uh, tell us that the woman is uh, equal to, to men and must have the same opportunity for education, for, uh, for other things. But in Islam, this uh, comes, uh, if it is coming up, it is coming very late. To the extent that uh, uh, the terms of inheritance, Muslim woman has no right to claim for any inheritance. And this can be a cause of lots of trouble. And the women themselves, they, they resent it. But where could they say it? Uh, but once you educate them, then they have the courage and the strength to claim their rights. And hoping at the, the same time that the government is there to protect the rights of the women. And in that way, we do expect that we'll be having a better society yes. than we actually have at the moment. So, in fact, a young Muslim girl must be exceedingly happy to see a Catholic school develop in their area as, as a way of, of escaping perhaps poverty or, or getting a, a better developing themselves and getting into a better situation. Certainly they would be a, a very happy except that there's the family background where the parents, uh, Muslim parents, will not uh, really allow, the, 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 not every girl will be allowed to, to go there. So we still have even to work on this basis to, to, to bring the uh, attention even to the families that it is for the liberation of this uh, uh, future. For the uh, betterment of the child. The, the child, yes. And and, uh, but uh, we, uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, as an example, uh, in one of our schools, the Catholic schools, in a place called the Bagamoyo, where, where, which was uh, really a center of slave trade, uh, but also the beginning of uh, Catholic uh, missionary work by the Holy Ghost Fathers. So we have established that school uh, to commemorate this uh, basic event of Christian uh, evangelization. And there we have, uh, we tried to, to uh, uh, give chance for all the children, and, but particularly of the uh, Bagamoyo area, because it's on the coast and it's mainly Islam. But unfortunately, even with that, uh, of the local uh, children, uh, no, uh, the local girls, because this is a, a, a clear a girls' school, girls' high, uh, secondary school, uh, high school. Of the local girls, we, we had uh, put the percentage at 25. That in every class, there must be at least 25% uh, of local girls. Yes. But at the moment, we do not have even 5% in that school, simply because of that problem which I mentioned, that the families, the parents do not allow them, the children to come. But the few that come, yes. uh, we had, uh, had a very nice experience. One of those uh, Muslim girls at the graduation was the best student. of all. The best of, student. Yes. And uh, she was best in character, best in also in uh, uh, the marks, etc. And uh, I said, uh, this is wonderful. It's a big achievement. And she was so happy also. And uh, so... Uh, and how do you do? You, you go to the Muslim leadership and you say, look, this school is open for, the, for you. I mean, how do you try and reach out within the Muslim community to encourage them to send their children to the schools? 
Well, we try we, uh, through uh, we, all, all the means, through the media and uh, everything that, uh, that we have no, no segregation of whatever uh, kind uh, for our schools. But uh, often the reaction is simple silence because they think that it, it may be a way of seeking conversions, conversions which we don't, we, 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 we try as much as possible to avoid this. And if anybody in our schools uh, says, I want to become a, a Catholic, we say, please uh, go to your parents and have a written document allowing you to do that. But otherwise, we don't. We don't accept it. Yeah, that. because it may be a source of uh, a misunderstanding. A great misunderstanding. Yes, 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 yes. So we try that. But it's a wonderful project. It is. <laughs> and you have hopes for a university. Oh, yes. In fact, uh, we, we, we have uh, the University of the, uh, the Catholic University of Tanzania. Yes. It's called South uh, St. Augustine University of Tanzania. Mm. And uh, there is it, doing exceeding, exceedingly well. Of course, we cannot uh, have uh, for every diocese to have <laughs> a university that yes. would be too, cost, too costly. Yes. But at the moment, we have the center in a place called Mwanza, uh, but we have also the branches in uh, Moshi, another one in Iringa, another one in um, Tuara, and we just started one in Songea and the other one in Bukoba. So we're trying to spread, and in Tabora also we have. So we're trying to spread that university, still a single university, but with the constitutive uh, colleges uh, everywhere. And uh, do Muslims also participate in the university level education? They do. They do. We, we have, of course, uh, due to the fact that from uh, primary and secondary school that they are uh, a minority, yes. they will remain always a minority. But there are good numbers. Yes. There are good numbers, which is very encouraging for us. Your Eminence, you've spoken uh, a bit about the, the, the positive challenges. Uh, uh, what would you say is your greatest need today in Tanzania? The greatest need uh, uh, at the moment in Tanzania, I would say, is this of uh, uh, having proper uh, political leaders. We, we have lots of other needs. We have uh, financial needs and uh, social, uh, uh, like, uh, medical care, all those. But I think the biggest problem which is facing us at the moment is that the uh, uh, leadership in the government is not yet uh, uh, that much concerned by the popul for, for the populace, uh, the entire po people of the country. Everyone goes into politics and wants to be a member of parliament, uh, but mainly for their own interests, self -interest. uh, private interests. Mm -hmm. So we're trying as much as possible. How can we really bring this concern for the people of Tanzania in the government? Well, uh, it's not easy, no. but we're trying. <laughs> and on the church level, what would you say would be the needs, for example, now the, the viewers, the people with us today in this program, uh, what would your appeal be on the level of the church? Uh, what is your greatest need? The greatest need uh, at the moment is uh, to, to, to have a, a, a proper evangelizers at all levels. Uh, if I start with, uh, start with the priests, of course, I would start with bishops, but bishops are so few, and there will always be. <laughs> few. That's the problem of the, the, the Holy Father, yes. to have the right bishop. Thanks be to God. And, and, <laughs> and the Holy Spirit. But uh, when we come to the uh, priests, we have vocations to the priesthood. Young, many young people want to come to, into the seminary and prepare themselves for, for priesthood, but we have got so few formatters. And uh, this is one of the needs which would, uh, we would uh, want to solve. And we are trying to send students, uh, our young priests or even young seminarians overseas. But there we, we meet such uh, big expenses that we cannot afford of ourselves uh, on the local level, on the local church level. So this is, is one of the needs.
And this is true also for the religious life, for the, the, the religious women and men. Formators yeah, for formators. the religious community. Yes. So we are first on one hand with a, 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 a need for properly formed religious uh, leaders, but at the same time there is uh, such poverty uh, in the country that... Uh, uh, it blocks you. It, it blocks us. That's it. Your Eminence, thank you for having been with us today in our program. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I, I hope we'll have another chance together. I hope so too. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having been with us today on our program. And if you would like to help His Eminence Cardinal Polycarp Pengo with his projects, his work for education, and for the need to form the formators for religious communities and for seminarians, I would encourage you to look at the contact information at the end of this program. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.